It's Sports Bazaar. Welcome aboard, everyone. If anyone isn't happy, we call it all off immediately. The hunt for the weirdest. There you go. Can you put out a fact sheet with this? <laughs> you my mind. I don't. I can't <laughs> keep up. Strangers. Catastrophic, amazing, bizarre. Multiple layers of stupidity coming together. What could go wrong? Most unbelievable. It's like a Coen Brothers movie. Stories to ever occur. And they're only going to get weirder from here. Get comfy, everyone. Some good, some bad. And some just... Bizarre, which we love. In the world of sport. How many chimneys could you do in a day? I've researched the Tour de France, not chimneys. Sports Bizarre. Right, police are called in. <laughs> For the players. Dennis Rodman is telling you to calm down. Testicle soup. Can I just stop you for a second? Don't act like you've never done this. I feel like once again we've strayed away from what I've researched. It's time for the leaders of the hunt. An old couple who've got our spark back. (laughs) It's Titus O'Reilly and Mick Malloy. Welcome back to the latest edition of Sports Bazaar with my good self, Mick Malloy. And of course, bringing it to the table as always, Titus O'Reilly, you're coming off a big one last week. Who was that guy? Tim Rossovich. Wow. Oh. I'm getting a lot of feedback. I really <laughs> wish I knew that guy. I, I know. I wish I'd been to college with him. I wish he was my roommate. I think it's him and young Griffo the two you'd most want to have a drink with out of what, what we've covered. <laughs> I do. Uh, and it, uh, I'm nervous about asking, what do you got for us this week? Well, we're, this is coming out the day before the Melbourne Cup. Okay. So sure. huge horse race in, in Australia. And, and worldwide. And now. worldwide, it's, one of the great big ones. What's interesting is of late, like all the Raiders, all the greatest horses from around the world come here because everyone wants this trophy on their mantelpiece if you're anyone in sport. Yeah. How long did the Godolphin try and win this race for? How many billions of dollars has oh, he yeah, spent? It's amazing. It's before, amazing. Before he got it. So It's a huge event. And so I thought, why don't we look back at the guy that invented it? Okay. And this is a story that we've talked about ones that should be a movie. This guy, it's like a it's like think of an HBO Soprano esque type story. Yes. A guy who goes from no, nowhere to take over everything. He's that sort of guy. Hey, he wears a few hats in the end. <laughs> he does. His name's Frederick Charles Standish. A okay. lot of people in Melbourne even where the race is based, don't know this history. It's it, not one they teach in school. It, bo- it boggles my mind. We don't teach any of our good history in school. All we learn about is Ned Kelly. And well, there's something else, but there's just this rich vein of cultural characters yeah. who deserve to be have a light shone on them just for their antics. Well, also they and, the, and it doesn't get covered because they get up to all sorts of stuff that <laughs> yes. people are proud it's not a proud of. Proud history, but it's the funny. I mean, if you're at high school, Come this on. stuff's interesting. Yeah, you know. So this is the main thing. So one thing that happened that kind of reminded me of this is. And this sort of brings some of the themes. So around the Melbourne Cup in in December 1987, Mm. so this is not the story we're going to tell today, but just sort of entering into it, there's the Melbourne Club, which is in Melbourne an exclusive male-only club. It is the most exclusive uh, club club there is. A gentleman's club, it would have been called. It's blue blood. It was dairy farmers. It was all the... The rich, well-to-do people. Yeah, the establishment. So, establishment. so when I say gentlemen's club, I don't mean exotic yeah. dancers. I mean <laughs> blue blood, very you know, very Old exclusive school. club. And in 1987, actually got broken into under the cover of darkness. They these thieves cut their way into the uh, into the building through a back gate, yes, a metal back gate. Didn't wake anyone up. Amazingly, snuck in. Went in and actually stole three, uh, sorry, two solid gold Melbourne cups that were being stored. When there. was this? This is in 1987, right? Oh, wow. This was, and so this I was. I told you everyone wants one of these cups might, on yeah, their mantelpiece. Anything. So they snuck in. They're both they're worth one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each, but worth much more culturally. That's yes. the gold that's made of them. And so the fact that people got in and got them and spirited them away, and the trophies have never been seen again. So no one ever got caught for this. Is this amazing moment? But what's really amazing is it brought together crime, the Melbourne Cup, and the Melbourne Cup and the, the Melbourne, Melbourne Club, Club all together. Wow. Which is our story that hadn't happened before since 1883, where this one man pulled those things all together. <laughs> which is the guy we're talking about today, okay. Frederick Charles Standish. He in 1852, he was standing on the dock in England and looking back at England, and it's fair to say things had gone pretty 
pear shaped for him. He was happy to see it disappearing in the rear vision mirror. He was, really, he was disappearing in the rear mirror. He, he, he was calling himself Francis C. Selwyn, not his real name. Okay. On that's, the man of ship's that's always manifest. A sign, I reckon. When, you, when, you, when you're travelling overseas <laughs> under an alias. There's a lot of our stories that start with someone <laughs> fleeing moneylenders. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the so so Standish had been born in England and he was fleeing in 1852 to go to the Australian colonies, not for a choice, but the fact that he had owned a huge amount of money from losing on gambling. <laughs> he had gambled away a fortune. He ha- was the son of Mr. Charles Standish of Standish Hall, which was a f- big country right. estate house. Pardon me, Your Majesty. Yes, and his father was a gentleman, significant means, connections, had all that stuff. He was a member of Parliament. This is okay. his dad. Um, and a close companion of the late of the king who just passed away, King George the Fourth. So he he was this renowned, respected man. His son takes over Not the so. fortune, loses it <laughs> within within moments. He's like the ninth Duke of Marlborough I told you about. He, yeah, he had not done exactly <laughs> in the Lamborghini. <laughs> Jesus. So Charles, his father, Standish's father, Charles, had used all his power and patronage to give his son every opportunity in life. Right. right. So Standish had been given absolutely everything. He'd been given a commission in the Royal Artillery um, and he'd served there for nine years. He'd attained the rank of captain um, and he'd also purchased for him Yorkshire's Caton Hall. So this is bought him at his own country estate. His dad right had here. bought him. So his dad had got him in the, the military, bought him this house. So what could go wrong? You think, what could go wrong? <laughs> it's now, the thing ever was, after. For, for Standish, he was incredibly well-liked. He was a man of the establishment, good company. He liked the finer things in life. Good he enjoyed, him. like, cigars and good... Yeah, good, good cognac. Good something. cognac, you know, all those sort of <laughs> leather-bound chairs, oh, you know, that, that sort of guy. <laughs> but he loved more than anything horse racing right. and he loved gambling on horse racing. These were his... Favorite thing, and he was the most popular punter in England with and the why bookies. Why was he popular? Because he, oh, lost. he was shit ass. Can I say, can I say <laughs> can I say to you this tradition still holds up today? Yeah, I went out recently and I was at a restaurant bar and I ran into the owner operators of one of our great online betting companies. Yes. I won't mention who they were, yeah. but you can have a guess. And, well, there's enough, though, that you... you <laughs> yeah, there's... A, there's <laughs> and he was out with a table of punters, right? And they, he was buying everything, paying for everything. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, oh, wow, these must be your, your, your best punters. He goes, no, these are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and he was doing everything he could to keep them, keep them going. entertained and happy. So if you're getting tickets to the box, yeah, it's because you are a cash cow. <laughs> you are hopeless. You, you are hopeless. Yeah. You are a degenerate gambler, and you're no good at it. <laughs> yeah, but they don't. They cut you off if you're. Uh, uh, if any you're good. any good, <laughs> but you know, they're not taking you to dinner. Yeah, I know. So, it, so, so he was the. Fa- he was that guy. He was, he was that guy. still that. He was that guy back then, and because he, he was rich. He'd go to the race course. He couldn't help himself. He'd bet and he'd lose heaps. And every bookie you saw him coming were like, "Thank God, <laughs> over here, yeah, yeah, over here, yeah." Pick and me. He, so he's incredible thing. Um, he he put huge sums of money on too. So it was big bets every time. Yes. And people said about him that he had a supernatural ability to lose. <laughs> <laughs> So he genuinely, <laughs> it was his superpower. Yeah. He, so whatever he bet he, on, it he, could have been the favourite. He cannot the dead win. Set, he could not win. Whatever he did, it was. So his father's fortune covered a lot of these losses, but his captain's salary he was on. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. And after all, he's deeply in debt. And um, the problem was he was such a charming, likable guy. People yeah. liked him, thought he was a great guy, incredibly genial, social yeah. guy. That they kept lending him money because they liked him. <laughs> but then they kept going, hang on, he's not paying me. But they almost couldn't resist. But got him into now. worse problems yeah. if they just didn't like him. You should have cut him off. Yeah. So by 1852, things are dire. He'd actually mortgaged Kate and Hall to the hilt. <laughs> and now people are starting to come looking for him. And at this point, it's not fun, people. No, okay. He's, he's owing money to the wrong people. Yeah, he's really in debt with everyone, yeah. you know. So he senses his time's up. So he sells Kate and Hall. To okay. pay off some of the mortgage yep. and all that. And that's why he finds himself on this boat heading out to Australia, the colonies the back colonies. then. He's on the just, run. Yeah, because that was where a man could go missing back then, right? That and was, start a new. Start a new. Stop gambling, turn up, get a job, raise yeah. a family, 
and you know, so leave it all behind you. Yeah, leave it all behind. No one's going to care that much. So, but he didn't know that. This is the thing about Standish is he was kind of always slightly lucky in certain ways. He didn't know that he was fleeing to a place that was going to be incredible fertile ground for him. Right. Because, because the gold rushes were just kicking off. Okay. So he, by chance, he didn't go because of the gold rushes. They, don't, they hadn't quite started. But yeah. by the time he arrives... It was in full swing. It's, it's blowing up the gold. And to give you an idea, you can't overestimate, if you're not familiar with Australian history, the, like in California, the impact of the gold rushes on Australia, uh, and Victoria especially, in, yeah. massive, like huge amounts of people. So um, it was late 1851, so he's arriving in 1852. Yes. Um, gold was discovered in Bendigo and Ballarat, and it goes from being this frontier outpost, the state of Victoria, yes. this frontier outpost that no one ever went to except for convicts, <laughs> to suddenly one of the richest places on earth. Wow. So Melbourne uh, Melbourne in Victoria, the major city, became basically the richest city on earth for a Incredible. while because of the gold rushes. The population went from 77,000 people in two years. It went from 77,000 people to 540,000 people in two years. That's massive. Yeah, so you know, it's jumping more than fivefold. And, you know, so huge things. So here's Standish arriving looking to get lost in the yeah. middle of this huge population growth and this huge injection of wealth. Yeah. He shows up, he's got n everyone got no money, but everyone's a transient because they've all arrived to look for gold. Yeah. No one really cares who you are, where you've come from. Yeah. So he gets here and he does not like this because he's lived his whole life as a gentleman and his only option is to go to <laughs> the gold fields and he hates physical labour. <laughs> Okay. Like these yeah. guys have more money. He's had servants, and this is his only option to and make he, make he, money. Yeah, he he doesn't know anyone. Doesn't know anyone in the yeah. in, in the in the colony. He's not too keen to tell people who he is. Who he is? Yes. So he goes and gets lost, and the gold fields are like. Think of the worst music festival you've ever been to. No showers, hairy blokes, no toilets, mud and mud everywhere, and they don't stop after three days. That's the gold. No, field. that's it. It's it's game disgusting. On. Absolutely disgusting. So he goes around from diggings to diggings. He's at Heathcote, Fry's Town, Castlemaine, Beechworth. He's looking there. He was as successful at prospecting for gold as he'd been at gambling. He doesn't find any gold. At he all. has the anti Midas touch. Yeah, he he's, has, just, he's the opposite of yeah. Midas. He's, so yeah. he's like broke, got nothing. Right. So he began, begins to illegally sell grog on the gold Of course fields. he does. He had no other option. <laughs> so he calls it a ginger beer business for, for the front. <laughs> and he sells some non alcoholic, but really oh, behind the scenes, it's him making. He's one of our first bootleggers. Yeah, he was. He was a bootlegger, basically. So he's been there for two years at this point. And he's got no prospects. Here's this guy born into the most privileged yep. of upbringing, and suddenly he's sitting there in the, in the gold fields with no money, running this little sort of faux yeah. ginger beer. He's Getting not, high he's not his making own money. It's not like yeah. the story of someone making money off a legal grog. He's not Al Capone, right? No, he he's can't even do that well, no. right? So. He's absolutely dejected. At the end of 1853, an old army buddy of his, a guy called Andrew Clark, arrives in the colony and he's been appointed the new Surveyor General, whose basically What's job that? is to divide up the land and decide who gets who what gets blocks and everything. Yeah. yeah. Because remember, no one was in Australia before the English got here. So That's he right. Yeah, it's yours. No one. Carve so, it up. So he was, he was about like saying, you know, this is what we're going to have, this is where we're going to put things, all that sort of stuff. Sort of, you know, he would work out, where they'd put all various um, works and things too to do sure. with power and electricity and all that stuff, sort of stuff. Um, they'd both gone to the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich and and in they were now there and they're in different points. Clark is now one of the most respected figures in the colony. He's based around a few of the colonial yes. places. And here's Standish who's, you know, done nothing. And Clark's setting up the first electric telegraph in Victoria. He's planning the first railways. He's established the roads boards. He sets up the Victorian constitution. So he's doing all this. And he eventually leaves a few years later to become the Inspector General of Fortifications in England. He's going places. So he's going right? places, He's the next right? first governor of Australia. Standish is on the run, broke, unemployed, <laughs> running a ginger beer business. <laughs> and he's living on the absolute fringes of society and it's broken him. So he catches up with Clark and he's got nothing to lose, right? 
Um, they catch up and they catch up in Clark's house in Northcote and over a night of heavy drinking, Standish <laughs> suddenly says, look, I'm stuffed. I've got nothing going on. Is there anything you can do to help me? And uh, his friend says to him, Clark says, look, I'll use all my connections to help you out. Don't worry. Right. Um, and he's true to his word. Within months, this man on the run from gambling debts running an illegal grog business <laughs> yes. is appointed the new assistant commissioner of police on the Bendigo Goldfields. <laughs> Talk about jobs for the boys. He's literally, a, he's literally working as a criminal. What's the meeting? What's the, what's the resume? What's <laughs> the job no, interview? He's a white aristocrat. So they go, it's, it's literally mates like... Yep, we run the colony. There's no oversight. This is the bit no one tells you about, like, Australian history. It's so corrupt <laughs> as to be hilarious, right? Like, he's just like, you're right. a mate. And so he becomes so, the give me his assist- position again. assistant commissioner of police on the Bendigo Goldfields. So he's there okay. to make sure everything's right. So this is a place where he's worked selling illegal grog and now he's <laughs> the assistant commissioner of police. Like, oh, it's bound to happen. Yeah, you know, these happens. So he's now got this, his foot in the door of the police force and the Victorian public service, right? <laughs> Jesus. And now the thing that's about this is while he hated manual labour, yeah. this is something he gets. He gets patronage, he gets power, he gets politics of the establishment. He understands how that world yeah, works sure. back in these days. And for instance, he's likeable. He could drink with the best of them, huge drinker. He loved playing cards. He knew the top brothels, which they all went to in the day. Right. And um, he was just good fun to have around. So he starts to using his position, becoming friends with like all the people in the police force, climbing the ladder. people. Yeah, and he, he's friends with everyone. Um, you know, so no one. He's still under his false name, or is no, he? No, at this point, he's gone back to just saying I'm Frederick Standish. Yep. So everyone's like just forgotten what what had gone on. So he starts integrating himself with the Victorian police force, all the key power brokers of the colony. By 1855, he's promoted to protector of the Ch- protector of the Chinese in Bendigo. So what that basically means is because there were Chinese, um, a lot of Chinese people came out for the gold mar- gold yes. rush and. They were basically the protector would say you're, you're there to protect them from the unruly mobs. Sure. What it mainly did is you locked them into their own little area and didn't let them leave yes. and then taxed them accordingly. Because <laughs> hey, their role was to provide equipment and jobs. They did yeah, a they lot of the... Mo- they did a lot of the, yeah, grunt work, but they were also doing like their own prospecting, but they weren't allowed to really often go where the good mines were. Like If, some, <laughs> if they found a mine, it sort yeah. of suddenly... Ended. So his but job was to do this... The, too, and it's it's historically it's why, and it still happens to this day. If you go out into the country and you find a really good country pub, it's likely to have a Chinese restaurant, because the first like food or exotic food ever introduced to Australia came from the gold fields where yeah. they Chinese would have it. And it's because it always as a kid I would go, why is there yeah, all these Chinese, Chinese restaurants? Why is every pub got a Chinese restaurant? And that <laughs> was the I know, and the we, and we and the Australians then hated the Chinese but loved their gambling. <laughs> Gambling <laughs> game, so they all mahjong and everything was really popular yeah. on the gold field. So, right. so his job is to protect them, um, but most of it was just collecting money from them, keeping them in their own area, and, and occasionally stopping the white miners from beating yeah, them up. It, that's right, keeping them safe, managing the Chinese. Yeah, it's just keeping them there. Um, in 1857, he's again promoted. This time, he's warden of the gold fields at Sandhurst. How's he working his way up the ladder? Is he doing a good job, or is he just he's he's just I- no, he's just integrating. <laughs> No is the short answer. <laughs> he's just integrating himself with all the people. Right. Like so he's become by this point good friends with all the top politicians, bureaucrats. He's if there's a night out, he's on it. Yeah, you know, he's yeah. he's inviting people around for parties, he's doing yeah. everything. He's a master of networking, what they'd call now. He's just Vice chairman for brothels. That's right. He's, he's literally much he's doing, doing that. He's like taking people to like brothels, he's doing whatever he needs to basically ingrain himself with yeah. the thing. So um, by 1855, he finally writes in his diary, heard at about 4.30 that I have just been appointed by the executive, meaning the Premier and Cabinet, yeah. to be the Chief Commissioner of Police. So 
<laughs> he's gone in six oh years from fleeing God. England uh, to being the chief, chief <laughs> commissioner of police for Victoria. Well done, Australia. That's great. Come out of here. So, so the, literally, in six years, the guy who fled from money lenders and in, has run an disgrace. illegal grog thing is now the head of police. Makes sense. Which is amazing, you know. Um, so it's so it's, it's so such a huge thing that um, he's now really ingrained with everyone, everyone in the police force and the politicians and public service now all know him. Yeah. He's a big plague. He's now living in Melbourne and all that. The th- second thing he does is he realises that to be successful you have to be integrated into these power networks. Sure. So the other one he does, aside from the Victorian Public Service, is the Freemasons of Victoria, which he he joins, even though his family's Roman Catholic, who are the sworn enemies hey, of the Freemasons. Explain Freemasons to uh, the quick history. Well, they were sort of a group a, a of secret, yes, a secret religious organization, organization, slightly religious, a science it was religious thing a cover. As well, religious was a cover for pro- a- Protestant background, right. and then very caught up often with. Some of the scientific views of the age, but they were sort of gentlemen's clubs, and they all supported each other. The and, networking, yeah, thing. and you would promote people who were also Freemasons. So for him, this is a great thing to join because it's like you don't have to work hard; you just need to be in the right group. So he joins the Freemasons. They had a secret handshake. That's all they I remember as a kid. Hands, all those sort of things. Yeah, I really wanted to know what it was. Yeah, and did they anyone ever tell you? They don't know. It's all secret meetings and lodges. What do you think it is? And, who knows? It's probably just a bunch of guys getting drunk. <laughs> every got every. It's like college fraternities. They're all just excuses for people to get drunk. Right. As comedians, we don't need a secret <laughs> club to do that. We're out there. <laughs> We're just doing out that. Proud. <laughs> so he actually goes from being. He actually goes. He rises to be the district grand master of the Freemasons of Victoria as well. <laughs> it, so he's suddenly chief commissioner of police and the head of the Freemasons. I um, imagine it's a bit eyes wide shut. You know, yeah, yeah. remove <laughs> your clothes. Am I in the terrain? Have you ever been to a I meeting? Would love if we Do you get, know anyone? I would love if we get contacted by them. <laughs> Guys, we'd like to set some some of your thoughts. What's some- your handshake? Tell us your handshake. <laughs> It'll be one of those ones where you cock your legs. Is this where we find you're... that you are a secret oh, friend? Well, See, we'd never not allowed know. to tell. <laughs> that would be the best <laughs> if we found out if Mick Malloy was the head Freemason. Call me wizard. <laughs> now, uh, was Wizard the best rank? Is that the highest? No, I think that's. I think you're either Who's thinking. Who's the Pooh Is that a Grand Pooh Bar? Thinking Harry Potter or Ku Klux Klan? There. <laughs> did they have it like a Hogwarts? Like what are they? Uh, no, I, I, I see. I'm not one. Once again, you're quizzing me about the bit I haven't researched. Did they have groups within the groups, or once you, once you're a Freemason, are you? Uh, do they wear like skirts. This? I think they wore skirts, <laughs> didn't they? <laughs> they did. Like a, like a kiltie, like a kilt. Type arrangement, a bit of free balling. Is that my? If I got the right club here, what am I talking about? They were very secretive. Uh, this is possibly the greatest introduction to Freemasonry. And you weren't allowed to leave, or is that the mafia? <laughs> no, no, I think you're not allowed to leave, are you? Someone contact <laughs> us. We'll, we'll do an episode on the Freemasons. All right, fire away. So the other one he does is so he's in the Freemasons. Is the chief commissioner of police? He also now joins the Melbourne Club. So how does he get in the? Oh, well, he's well to do. He's well to do. Of so course, he gets in. Eighteen thirty-eight. It was formed by squatters. You know, yeah, we people that took up vast tracts of crown land that because there wasn't many people in Australia at the time in terms of the white establishment. Who, what was formed by squatters? The, the Melbourne Club. The Melbourne Club, Club yeah. Get so, out. Yeah, it was where they would – so these are these are white guys that went out there and they pushed the Indigenous people off their land, but it, they didn't own the land, but they claimed, claimed it. huge parts of it, ran sheep usually on it. Yeah. And then because they became rich and powerful, eventually they sort of – there was a bit of a power struggle, but they yeah. often – Got to end up owning that land because they just took it by force. Sort of the Melbourne went, Club. They were rich, yeah. So the Melbourne Club, it was eventually first. It was their place to come in when they came into town. It was their place to stay for the squatters. Yeah. Then in 1858, it moved to 36 Collins Street, where it still is. This is the time 1858 was when Standish joins. He's the newly appointed chief commissioner. He becomes a member. Um, and this is when it's just starting to become the social headquarters right, of Melbourne's yeah. establishment and upper class. And he felt right at home there because he just loved it because it was always all-night drinking sessions. There were fights. There was everyone who was anyone was there. He was <laughs> there was playing cards all night. So much so that he, lives, happy place. he lives there. 
He moves what do you mean? in. He, he lives, moves into the Melbourne club. He moves club. in to live. He, sta- he lives in the Melbourne club. Oh, which now I don't think anyone does, but at the time he lived there. Wow. So he's living there and he... His time there was not without incident. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at one stage, a card game goes south and he was severely horsewhipped in a dr- drunken fight by fellow Melbourne Club member Captain Robin, Robin Matchell. In even more spectacular fashion. Hang on, were you saying horsewhipped as in he was actually horsewhipped? Yeah, actually horsewhipped. <laughs> they were having a drunken That's fight. It's a bad night at the cards. And the difference then is people would have My a fault. horse. People would have a horse <laughs> on them. That's the difference. As you get the- like, well, they're all riding horses. God, this is the difference. And I've had some rough nights. Oh, I've never come home. And gone, How did you go tonight? Oh, you're not going to believe this. I got a horse whipped. That's- yeah, so he got horse whipped. In another one, in 1882, in even more spectacular fashion, he was thrown through a window by Colonel <laughs> Craigie Halkett after Standish called him a provocative name. Now, we don't know what the name uh, uh, what it guess. was. It would be like uh, you, near do well. Near, near do, do well. well. I'm going with near do well. <laughs> um, Standish declines to press charges. Remember, he's the Chief Commissioner. <laughs> Chief Commissioner gets it's just been a drunken brawl. A, a drunken brawl and it's play on. Yeah, play nothing on. to see here. And they go, do you want to press charges? <laughs> no. What he, what he does is he goes, no, far more serious punishment. Um, Halkett, the guy who threw him out, has to resign as a member of the Melbourne Club. That's what he do, That's his punishment, oh. which is like social death, you know. Yeah. Um, so despite all this, he is now this. So, so between Freemasonry, Chief Commissioner of Police, <laughs> Melbourne and Club. living in the Melbourne Club and knowing everyone, he is one of the key centres of power Absolutely. in the colony. All of a sudden, and he decides to use this power not to like you know make policing better or anything, but to fund his and promote his favourite thing, horse racing. So, is he back on the horse racing as yet? Yeah, or? this is where. So. Because so, some he decides that horse racing, and this is the one thing in his life, no matter what he's doing, being police, chief commissioner or whatever, horse racing is undoubtedly his number one priority in life. Even More though he's absolutely else. shit house at, at, the, gambling at the thing, on them, yeah, but gambling. He just can't but he help loves it. horse racing. Ah. He loves it. So um, now that he's got this, he's losing all his money again on horses. But being the chief commissioner of police yeah. makes it hard to collect. <laughs> It's probably illegal. It, it's, it's probably it's, it at that yeah, stage. So, right so basically he's betting with whoever they want and they just have to take the money <laughs> and if he wins they have to give it to him but if he loses they're like, uh, bad luck, well let's just forget this one because he's the Chief Commissioner of Police. So, he has worked out. So unlike in England, this time that there's no money lenders coming after him. Because there's no money lent. And he's the Chief Commissioner of Police so what are they going to do? <laughs> you, know, you know, threaten him? Like He's like... Uh, So he joins the um, Victorian Turf Club, which was the big club at the time. It was one of two bodies that had control of racing in Victoria. The other was the Victorian Jockey Club. And it wasn't long before, with all the institutions he joined, he becomes the leading figure. He's not running the VRC. The the, the precursor to it, one of the two clubs that's the precursor to it. Oh, my God. Um, He decided the Turf Club needed a schedule of races to rival what the Jockey Club, their their, um, sort of their, not enemies, but their, uh, the other major body that was doing better than them. They had a, a popular program that had the 2,000 guinea stakes, uh, that, which was the most prestigious okay. race in the colonies at the time. So they were running... That's still the, race today? Yeah, the Jockeys Club are doing this really good, like really amazing uh, racing calendar. The Turf Club, they're sort of the lesser of the two big groups, but Standy suddenly is there. He'll whip it into show. And he's like saying, well, we need to do stuff. So he gives notice to the Turf Committee in a meeting that they should move to have a race similar to the Chester Cup at home back in England to be called the Melbourne Cup to be run annually at the spring meeting of the club. So this is him saying we should do a Melbourne Cup. This is his idea. This is his idea, which is he knew because he was a keen gambler, he knew what the punters wanted. And so what it was is he knew that the Chester Cup back in England that he knew about was a handicap race where the be- big, bigger uh, the better horses are given bigger weights to carry to make it f- uh, f- make it much more fair, making the um, more horses would enter and then that would have higher prize money and more betting would occur. So he knew how to design a race that would have and kind of easier to rig. 
Yeah, you know, wait for ages, wait for age. But as soon as you get handicappers involved and you can nobble That's a horse right. or pull it up or a jockey can Yeah. You know, this is right. This is right. So he's so this is he's invented the Melbourne Cup and he's an absolute genius, genius at promoting and organising races. Can't win on them. <laughs> Worst gambler in history, but he becomes his, his, his amazing thing. So he's the driving force. He becomes the driving force in the industry for decades. Still a terrible gambler. I Never am, gets this better. This is an incredible story. So the first Melbourne Cup's held on Thursday the 7th of November 1861. It saw 17 horses enter. It's a two-mile race. Yes. It attracted a crowd of 4,000, which was a large crowd, but it was less than hopeful because... Just days earlier, the city had been plunged into mourning with the news of the death of explorers uh, Robert O'Hara Burke and William John Wills. So Burke and Burke Wills. Burke and Wills. Which if you're Australian, uh, you know Burke and Wills. It's so folklore. Two explorers that went up into the, you know, the inner parts of Australia, which was still very unknown at the sure. time and um, ended up dying. Uncharted areas and yeah. then died only in a very not far from the coastline, which was their ambition. Yeah, where they wanted to, to get, get to. So very famous. Losers. They were losers, though, but they were explorers. They were explorers. They just, they just didn't get the job done. It's kind of funny, but they died. They were pretty inept at how they set out mm. to do it. Like the Indigenous people lived and walked all around there with no problems. No, they just, I didn't even think the, to invent the a pair of shoes. had no idea what he, he was doing. He was a bit out of his depth. <laughs> they were out of their depth. Terrain. Um, so on the morning of the first cup, to give you a sense, the cup's been run for the first time. The Age newspaper printed Will's last diary entry. All the government buildings are draped in black because it's a day of mourning, because yeah. these guys were sort of heroes. Yeah. And, the, you know, when they'd set out, it had been a big thing. So it wasn't sort of the day of frivolity to get people to go out to the <laughs> races. Here again, though, Standish is in the middle of things because yeah. his... Um, what hat's he wearing today? <laughs> because he was on the... Ex, um, his um, friend, Andrew Clark, who got him the job yes. as the, the goldfields, he was on the exploration committee for the expedition yep. of Burke and Wills, and Standish was Burke's commanding officer and a close friend because he was a police officer, yeah. Burke, and so Standish <laughs> knew him. In fact, Burke wrote, um, <laughs> of Burke and Wills, wrote to Standish just before he set out on his trek and it said, I'm confident of success and willing to accept the alternative success or disgrace, although failure is possible. This self-imposed task, as you call it, is no sinecure, and I think it will take the sting out of me if I see it out. Goodbye, my dear Standish. From yours, ever sincerely, uh, Robert uh, O'Hara Burke. So he's this literally in the middle. He then be so Standish becomes a pallbearer for Burke at his state funeral, which was attended by 40,000 people. So this is a huge thing. So despite this tragedy, 1861, Melbourne Cup goes ahead. Stan Standish is the steward for the day. <laughs> he's the chief commissioner of police, but he's running the day at the race. He's the steward. <laughs> he's got a bet on it too, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, the race, um, it was not without incident, the first one. One horse ran off before the start. Um, and three horses fell during the day. Two of them had to be put down, which is a tradition that stays with us to this day. Yes, sadly. Uh, the winner was a horse called Archer, famously from New South Wales. One of the first two, did it yeah. not? Yeah, which gave the New South Wales huge bragging rights over Victoria. And did the, was the horse, correct me if I'm wrong, or is this legend, but they actually, the, to get to Melbourne, they walked the horse the, from the, Sydney to Melbourne? No, the, to, the, the, the rumour no, was he I've walked. for that. Yeah, he, they, the rumour was he walked from Sydney to Melbourne, the horse went the whole way, which is a long way. Right. Well, that's 800 miles or something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, instead, they put him on a boat, a steamer. <laughs> so, you know, close, close. It's um, further than Burke and Wills walked, really. Yeah, <laughs> he did. At least uh, he made it. Yeah. Uh, so the Melbourne Cubs run the next year, and again, uh, Archer wins, eight lengths in front. So this is Victorian pride's severely dint dinted. Yeah. And the New South Wales, they... See, this is they're just loving Again, it. Anyone listening in the world, these two cities have had from yeah, it's like Boston, as long New as they've York been here, or, it's a big you know, thing. Yeah, it's a big thing. Um, so they, <coughs> the Archer's trainer, Etienne de Mestre, he's got his eyes trained on third victory in 1863, and he sent off his application for the race by telegram. The telegram arrives on a public holiday in Victoria and doesn't come to the stewards until the following day, where they promptly rule it out as having missed the deadline. Oh, no. Standish is one of the stewards. He's overseeing this, is he? So they basically don't let Archer come in. A sensible thing would have just gone, yeah, the telegram showed up on the public holiday. 
it's not from when we received it physically. Yeah. It's from when it got yeah. sent. But they don't. They go. They don't. So the New like, South Wales go nuts. You lose. Yeah, and go. We're boycotting this race. We're not coming. So only seven horses compete in the 1863 Melbourne Cup, and the race looks absolutely stuffed. The Victorian Turf Club's problems not just ended there. The competition with the Victorian Jockey Club was sending both of them broke. So yeah. Standish has made the the Turf Club competitive, but it's sending them both broke. And they're dividing the punters and the horses across them right. both. They're spreading them too thin. So Standish is getting the thick of the action as a solution sought for this. Both clubs agree to cease operating and form a new body, the Victorian Racing Club or the VRC, to oversee racing in Victoria, including the club, there you go. which exists to today. So Standish was instrumental in setting up the VRC. But who's going to run it? Well, he, he um, ends up um, becoming a founding member of the club <laughs> And he's heavily involved until his death. He holds almost every position you can imagine. <laughs> Committee man, handicapper. <laughs> <laughs> Steward. Steward. <laughs> treasurer and finally chairman. Oh, my God. It's like letting the mice run the cheese factory. <laughs> You've just given him every lever yeah. in town. So he's like the – even though – This is his dream. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely huge on this. Um, and this sets the ability. This also sets up the ability to reset relations with the New South Wales. So they use this to say, "Look, we're sorry that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Let's let bygones be bygones and, and forget about it." And they appoint a guy called Robert Baggett as secretary of the new VRC committee. He's a surveyor and engineer from Sydney, so this is part of making New South Wales feel happy with yeah. this. And he'd just built the, he'd levelled and re-turfed the Melbourne Cricket ground just before so he comes and does the same with flemington and he's the one that builds a big grandstand he um plants roses and makes all the beautiful gardens which there is today. still its signature yeah. feature today he also convinced the victorian government to declare the melbourne cup a public holiday so he's the guy that drove it's the that. race that stops a nation yeah as it's known in australia so this is with standish in the background though yes just working away working away so by 1880 the melbourne cup's pulling crowds of a hundred thousand which is a figure it still pulls to this day. Yep. What year is that? Uh, that's in 1880. Jeez. So it's, it's like a third of the colony is showing up. It's showing right? up Like it's this. everywhere. Standish's other problem, though, is um, he is technically chief commissioner, despite the fact <laughs> <that> police, <laughs> police commissioner, despite yes. his racing stuff. And the force he's inherited is not exactly a well-oiled machine, okay. right? It's all the police tended to drink and frequent brothels so much that in 1854, a special jail had to be built just to hold police officers who had broken the law to keep them away from the general prison population. Oh, I live in the wrong era. <laughs> you do. That's all I'm saying. I know. What You're a, a fun man time. out of time. Oh, so geez. literally they had to build their own police station, their own jail <laughs> just for police officers because so many of them were in jail. Incredible. Um, so, this, so this is a, now Standish was a great culture fit for these kind of guys because <laughs> he was exactly like he them. knew what they his were doing. drinking and gambling was so widely known in the colony that everyone knew about it. He tended to favour men of similar interests such as cards, gambling, and drinking. That was his office. And brothels. That was it, his, yeah. He did all his meeting. He's so power he, broking. He promotes anyone who is in that sort of thing. Um, Standish is known to. Uh, frequent brothels know all the good ones. He famously held a dinner party where he hired naked prostitutes and he picked them with pale skin and made them sit on chairs covered with black cloth to better showcase them off to the guys he's invited to his party. This he's, is the, he's thought this through. This is the chief commissioner of police. <laughs> <laughs> they never teach you this at school. Wow. They never say this is who's... <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't go unnoticed. It's not as much fun these days, isn't it? If you, imagine if you were chief of police yeah, now. And did that. Yeah, that's, yeah. Not, that's not. You're not going to. This sort of baby even then, though, didn't go unnoticed. Between 1860 and 1863, three parliamentary committees investigated him across a range of issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, almost all stemming from the fact that Standish, with all various distractions like horse racing yeah. and everything, Barely ran the force at all. Yeah. So it was into the there were like these things into his running of the police force, and they basically went. He never was at work. They where he'd been horsewhipped. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They? Um, he was seen to allow corruption in the force to run unchecked, and he protected members of the um, community, some who were involved in criminal enterprises, mainly brothels, mm. to do what they do. Um, he, though Standish, this is where like he's a powerful guy. 
In a warning to potential whistleblowers, any a few officers have spoken out. He refuses to um, re he sacks them, and then the parliamentary committee, one of them says, "You have to reinstate them," and he just refuses and goes, "I'm not okay. hiring him back." Yeah. So he does that sort of stuff. Um, they committees all recommend he should be replaced as chief commissioner, but the government ignores it because he's so connected. He knows them all. He knows them all, and they get closer to Standish. They seek him out more and more on advice on a range of matters, and in return, he helps them often circumventing police hiring policies to get people the government liked into the force. <laughs> so he just ignore and do favors. He's like who's the American Hoover? Yeah, he's like just, he's, he knows too much. He knows, he's, too much. He knows everybody. So yeah. good luck trying to remove him because. Yeah, he just was doing whatever he He knows where all the bodies are buried. The force keeps being found by all these parliamentary committees as wholly unfit and regarding the, the, what, and just having no moral centre whatsoever, <laughs> inept at best and corrupt at worst. <laughs> That's on his tombstone. That's what one That's, of the things is about the police there force. There it is. Um, still nothing happens, and it's only years later we kind of find out the real reason why he could – have Parliament look into him and yes. not go down. Um, the first clue was in a diary by journalist James Smith who wrote, Captain Standish is furnished with a report every morning of the numbers and the names of those who have spent the night in the better class of brothels. Um, <laughs> so every morning he gets this list of who's uh, been in all the brothels that he can use to basically paperwork. To blackmail such. everyone. <laughs> Right, so that's what one thing he's doing. So that's how, partly how he's projecting himself. Another guy, Chief Superintendent uh, John Sadler, who was the police officer in charge of the operation um, in Glen Rowan that caught Ned Kelly, mm. he wrote in his diary that one of the reasons Standish escaped the 1870 parliamentary inquiry was a high officer of the state in those evil days, a man notoriously of unclean life, was found late at night under ambiguous circumstances on the private premises of a gentleman residing in one of the suburbs. The owner of the premises did not wait for an explanation. He took the law into his own hands and severely punished the intruder, finally kicking him out of the place. Partly to safeguard himself, the gentleman called early on the following day to the Chief Commissioner of Police, related the circumstances and sought advice as to what proceedings he should take. Then followed such negotiations and interventions of friends as might have been expected with the result that the matter was hushed up. The high official recognised, of course, that it was the intervention of the head of the police service that saved his situation. It also saved the police department for when the schedule for the disbanding of the service came before him, he promptly vetoed it. <laughs> so he's basically got dirt on the most yes. powerful people. This is how it works. It's, it's just slightly more sophisticated yeah. these days, isn't it? The other way he ingrains himself, and this shows you, yes. in... He was asked to escort Prince Alfred, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was the second son of Queen Victoria, around Melbourne when he toured in 1867 <laughs> to 68. Okay. So this is Queen Victoria's son. It's the first royal All to right. visit the colonies How'd ever. How'd that go? He was the, well, he comes out and Standish um, was nominally responsible for the prince's security. Um, so he takes him around. The prince... Um, uh, spent Christmas morning with the governor and his family before then hooking up with Standish. And Standish, after he'd spent Christmas morning, this is Christmas Day, yes. takes him to Sarah Fraser's exclusive brothel. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes the, the prince. What else are they going to do? Yeah. You know what it's like after Christmas yeah. morning and you <laughs> have a big lunch? Have a big yeah. lunch. Well, they're going to lie on the couch or Standish and Prince Head Albert, the hit, they hit it off so well that they just end up hanging out the whole time. Stanley takes him to the Variety Theatre to drink with the actresses backstage <laughs> and then he takes him along to the races, which was a huge coup for the VRC. Wow. So he's just doing everything once. They get along so well, they re have dinner every night of his stay at the Melbourne Club, followed by cards and gambling, and they even they spend all the Christmas together as well. The Prince comes back in 1869, this time with no official engagements, <laughs> and he joins Standish <laughs> at the Melbourne Club again. And spends all his time at Sarah Fraser's brothel. <laughs> <laughs> so he's literally taking oh, I love it. the prince's prince out. They're buddies. Around. They're buddies. So no wonder the government's trying to take him down. And he's like, seriously. <laughs> the real problem that finally gets him is f f all the parliamentary committees, and by this point of his life, there's been four parliamentary committees into looking <laughs> into him. None of them can touch him. Yeah. Ned Kelly succeeds. He is the Chief Commissioner 
when Ned Kelly is on the run. Is so the right? Kelly gang, Australia's most famous bush ranger, yeah. he is basically responsible because he goes on the run for over two he's years. He's running amok. He's running amok. He's and ki- it, killing police. He's this killing thing. policemen and they still can't catch him. He exposes the mismanagement and corruption of Victorian's police force that Standish is in charge of. So in 1878, the Kelly gang, they're already known to police for livestock, theft, assault, robbery. Um, they're visited at home by Constable Alexander Fitzpatrick, um, who's attempting to arrest Ned's brother Dan. Yes. And in response, Ned shoots F- Fitzpatrick in the arm, then f- uh, forced him to remove the bullet with a knife so it couldn't be used as evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems excessive, don't you reckon? <laughs> uh, uh, they let Fitzpatrick leave then after getting him to take the bullet out. Like, a violent I, kind of warning, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, and they said they made him promise not to tell anyone. Uh, a promise Fitzpatrick forgot the minute he got yeah, he to left, safety. Yeah. Um, they go now on the run. They flee, flee into the Wombat Ranges in Victoria's northeast, and the area, the gang know this area really well, so the, they've got an advantage over yeah. the police. The policemen looking for the gang were camped at some old miners' huts near Stringbark Creek, Stringybark Creek, and the Kelly gang, despite normally being hunted, they know exactly where the police are. They confront them and they kill three officers. This public outcry and Standish is it's too much now, is you? huge. The Victorian Parliament passes the Felons Apprehension Act 1878, which not only outlaws the gang, but it made it legal for anyone to shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> Righto. It's, it's like a, a duck season isn't or something, amazing? isn't it? You I, can, when I read that, I was like, they just incredible. pass a law and go, You're anyone right. can shoot go those guys. Life. As a law we should be thinking about bringing back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who would you put on that? Despite them doing this, yes. so they've killed three officers. Anyone in Australia, anyone can shoot them legally. Mm. The police are all after them. The gang remain on the ro- run for another two years, and this is where they rob banks in Euroa and... Uh, Jewelry and they kill a police informer. They do all this stuff. And Standish is just absolutely at a loss, can't yeah. do it at all. Um, in the aftermath of this, they finally get Kelly after two years and he's hung. Um, but the Longmore Commission is convened to look into it and Standish appears as a key witness before this and it's into how Ned uh, Kelly could uh, remain on it. How we went, yep. And despite like all his political capital, he can't hide the fact that under his leadership, the force is just completely dysfunctional. Right. Catching criminals wasn't their strong suit. Not really suit. their thing. Like he's running an amazing spring. He's, he's carnival. doing some beautiful stuff, <laughs> but the policing is not going well. Um, this is a bit where um, one of the reasons they find is while the Ned Kelly hunt is on, Standish at one point suspends the hunt. Uh, because the weights for the Melbourne Cup are being declared. <laughs> He's like, oh, guys, I, I know you're busy with this. Ned, I know you're busy with this Ned Kelly thing. Can but, we just uh, park that for a minute. Now, the, the weights. <laughs> so he's literally like running, doing... Also, in this commission, the widespread corruption's uncovered. Um, there's two um, who uh, there's two guys, a guy called Winch and Lana. They're singled out for involvement with prostitution, gambling, taking money from hotels, and they're very protected by Standish. So yes. He gets into that. He reads the writing on the wall Standish does in 1880. He's be- and he, he says, I'll resign. I'm done here. I'm done. He'd been police commissioner for 22 years at this point. <laughs> he's had a good run. Despite this and this public shaming over this, he's still really well liked. And in 1881, he becomes chairman of the VRC. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, uh, his work as chairman of the VRC is, is you know, less stressful. But he finally, in 1883, passes away and his pursuit of pleasure over his life is the key, but he dies of cirrhosis of the liver <laughs> and a fatty degeneration of the heart. Wow. He's 58 years old. He sort of leads by this weird thing. He's at the middle of Burke and Wills, Ned Kelly Eight. and the Melbourne Cup. He's knee deep in Australian history. He, yeah, he's in the middle of everything. He created the Melbourne he Cup. He created the Melbourne Cup, the VRC, so if you if you're a Melbourneian, he's at the cent. He's he lived at the Melbourne Club till his death. He died at the Melbourne Club. Is there a statue of him anywhere in no, Melbourne? No, he's just one of these. He's a founding member of VCA. He invented the Melbourne Cup. All these things he did. All these things. Chased Ned Kelly, yeah. <laughs> badly, <laughs> um, and did all this. And he's barely spoken about that much. 
Um, not bad considering he left England debt-ridden under a false name. Um, on New Year's Day, the Standish handicap is run at Flemington. It the is Standish, honor. there it That's is. That's it. Can I say this? Um, I know we have Farlap's heart. Farlap, a famous horse, which mm. is most famous, uh, won the Melbourne Cup. Heart is on display at the museum. I feel they should have his liver. <laughs> the Standish's liver in a cabinet next to it, and this is just as important yeah. to racing and history in Australia. You've done it again. Is that not a, we say this occasionally, but if that's not a movie, yeah. that if we don't shine a light on this and somehow go, how much fun can one guy have in 58 <laughs> years? I put it to you. Thank you once again. Titus O'Reilly. We're on all the socials. Follow us there. If you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, it helps us out. And if you've got an idea for a story you'd like us to do or got some feedback, send an email to us, info at sportsbazaar.com. See you next week. Cheers.